All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the IEEE EMBS webinar series on the frontiers of uh, biomedical imaging and analysis. Uh, my name is Ping Kun Yan. I'm an associate professor of uh, biomedical engineering at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm the vice chair of IEEE BIIP Technical Committee, which the, is the organization uh, hosting the webinar series. Um, so our guest speaker today is Dr. Shakufi Azizi, um, together, we also have Professor Ji Wang from uh, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, who is very well known as a pioneer in AI in biomedical imaging. So uh, Dr. Azizi is a, a senior uh, research scientist at Google Research, the brain team, uh, now part of the DeepMind. Um, she completed her PhD at the University of British Columbia, uh, Vancouver, um, in uh, 2018. Uh, it was my privilege to work with her during her PhD on diagnosing prostate cancer from ultrasound images with uh, machine learning techniques. Dr. Aziz's research concentrated on uh, developing simple and efficient machine learning algorithms that are broadly applicable to a range of computer vision applications. Uh, specifically, over the past few years, she has been focused on uh, developing methods to accelerate the uh, translation of AI solutions uh, to clinical impact. I'm sure you have seen that she authored uh, quite a few Nature publications uh, recently. Her work has been covered in various uh, media outlets and recognized by multiple awards, including the Governor General's uh, Canada Academic Gold Medal for her contribution in improving diagnostic ultrasound. So it is our great pleasure to have Dr. Aziza today to speak about her latest research on exploring foundation models for generalist biomedical AI. Without further ado, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about exploring foundation model for um, generalist biomedical AI. And but before uh, jumping uh, basically uh, to the topic, I want to open up um, uh, with this like important question that like usually I'm asking people that like why we are all of us uh, here and why we are all interested in top in this topic of like medical and AI. And like for me, um, I'm guessing that it's because most of the people that you are working in this space, they are pretty much. Um, believer that AI can totally transform medicine and the way we basically practice medicine and um, it can help us to improve healthcare and improve lives of billions of people and basically make, the, um, make them like healthier. So we know that it's, it, it's clear basically based on all of the activities that's been happening over the past few years uh, that the opportunity that we have we have here is immense uh, for example uh, scaling up uh, imaging uh, powered by ai uh, can basically avert millions of deaths caused by cancer or we have a studies that that you're showing that using ai we can catch diseases like tb which are basically uh, worst t deadliest killer very early on. So all of these things are great. We have huge potential uh, for um, patient impact uh, using AI. And we know that it, it has been tremendous interest in applying AI also for medicine and health. And this interest has been spanning basically uh, industrial research labs such as Google, uh, DeepMind, or government back organization and uh, an in academic institute. And uh, over these years, we've been looking at a range of application. For example, at Google, we have um, we develop method that they can uh, help clinician to detect breast cancer more accurately than ever, or uh, help people better understand their skin conditions and help researcher uh, sequence genome more precisely than ever. And um, but all of these methods they've been like developed in an isolated fashion. And um, one of the most interesting characteristics of, of such uh, development is that. AI uh, and AI solution has been fairly accessible to everyone. 
I can argue that like um, most of the students right now in their high school, they have um, access, um, they have easy access basically to resources, to train models and like uh, learn uh, most of the methods uh, such as any uh, deep learning expert that is like sitting basically maybe at Google or anywhere else. So um, to give you like a more uh, solid uh, example of like what we are like talking here and like the amount of progress that we had over the past decade, um, we can see that like if we go and look back the type of publication that we have, given the widest British interest, uh, what we are seeing is um, exponential increase in the number of research papers that we have uh, at the intersection of AI and healthcare in recent years. We have a hundred times increase since 2014, which was the time that I started my PhD. Last year alone, we had around 20,000 publications in this space, which is a huge number. And we have many scientific paper, but translation of these methods to product um, has been very slow. And um, we can see that um, we don't have like real world clinical impact out of all of these publication and research that we are doing. And this um, real clinical impact uh, has been rather slow. In fact, we have very few medical AI products that has been used in hospital and clinical set, set up basically. And there is a very important number here that like uh, for digital health, investor has been and spent uh, more than $100 billion since 2010 to activate uh, effective digital health. And still, there is not a single generational comp uh, company here uh, or any product that has even thousands of users, let alone millions or billions of users. So most of the AI system that we've been developed so far are, um, are not really ready for real world clinical uh, application and to be used at a scale. And um, beyond multiple factors that has been like played role um, for the slow adaptation of AI models in clinical setup, uh, including um, regulation or uh, like uh, market. Uh, from the technical point of view, if you want to look at the models that we are designing, I believe that there are a few technical key challenge that, uh, that they are like a still uh, remain um, on address. One of them is generalization, which means the ability of the model to maintain a stable performance under distribution shift and rapidly adapt to new environment using minimal supervised data as possible. The second one is reliability of AI model and AI solution that we are designing, uh, which is the ability of the model to say accurately when it doesn't know um, things and backtrack human in the loop um, to, to avoid any mistake. And the third one uh, is around interactivity and expressivity of these models. And interestingly, this interactivity has been totally neglected um, um, area uh, in AI research for medical uh, up until a few years ago. So if we look at medicine as a practice um, that is like basically related to humans, um, language is at the heart of that. And uh, yet most of the AI system that we have so far are incapable of having any sort of interaction with user or physicians or um, people that they are basically using them. And most of this lack of interaction uh, directly leads to frustration, mismatch of expectation, and in turn prevent effective and more broader uptake of AI in real world clinical workflow. So luckily for us, um, fortunately we had, um, while all of this progress that has been like happening at the intersection of AI and medicine. 
Uh, it has been a major trend and uprising around foundation model for medical AI uh, in the last few years. And um, that basically resulted in emergence of a new paradigm, uh, which really offer us an opportunity to rethink and redesign medical AI from ground up, ready for development at a scale with the featured and capability that you're like desired uh, for that uh, scale. So to give you a quick summary of what is the foundation model, uh, the way that uh, I, I like to think about foundation model is that these are like models that they are larger scales, train on large data set and corpa with broad data and like usually using large compute and often using self-supervision, um, self-supervised learning objectives. And this model, the, it has been shown that they can be adapted to a wide range of downstream application easily. And well-known example of such models are family of large language models that for sure you have been like dealing with them um, past year. It could be uh, like BERT, GPT, chat GPT, GPT-4, or a um, bunch of like Google's um, large language models such as T5, Palm model, and uh, we have in the vision space, we have um, vision transformer models that has been trained on large, uh, large corpus of uh, data. And, uh, but uh, what are these specific capability of uh, foundation models that they are like very interesting and appealing for real world application? The first and foremost and important one is uh, these models are good few shot learners. This means that they have been, um, they have a rapid ability to adapt to new task and environment using a few label data as possible and sometimes just using instruction, which is like, very interesting. It means that we can design model using less data, less label data, and it means that the turnout of uh, design is going to be very uh, fast. The second one is that they are good generative models. So they have impressive gener generative capabilities such as to text to image synthesis, generating high quality reports and notes and beyond that. This can enable effective human AI interaction and collaboration directly. And uh, the third one is reliability of this model. Such large model when trained using large scale training process um, they lead that uh, the calibration and auto distribution performance uh, seems to improve. Um, and for large variety of domain and settings. And there has been um, work from Google, for example, Plex, uh, uh, which is going very in depth uh, in the top topic of reliability of uh, foundation models. However, it's a good reminder that there are still safety concerns around uh, foundation models. So um, the question that we have at hand is that given all of this progress that we have in foundation model with um, um, new capabilities that can enable uh, uh, fast uh, AI development, how we can basically leverage uh, this model to build better medical AI. And it's clear that what emerged as a result of such foundation model training setting uh, is that um, the paradigm that we are basically designing a system and more specifically medical AI system is changing. No, instead of a narrow single model for each task um, and each basically healthcare facility, uh, we can have uh, a generalist biomedical artificial intelligence. And um, these models are general purpose foundation model, and we can adapt them across a wide range of scenarios. And, um, and they are capable of flexibly encode, integrate and interpret uh, the data that we have in the medical domain at a scale. So in the remainder of this talk, uh, the thing that I'm going to try is to introduce some of the recent work from my team that kind of show that um, how we can basically effectively use foundation model uh, to build to our more uh, generous capabilities 
and address some of the blockers uh, that we have uh, in medical AI systems. So uh, the first work that, that I'm gonna talk about is uh, Remedies, uh, which is a foundation model in medical imaging space. And um, this paper basically targeting robust and efficient medical imaging uh, with supervision and has been published uh, a few months back at uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering. So, um, as I explained before, one of the key translational challenge that we had is the um, data efficient generalization. And by data efficient generalization, I mean uh, that the model should be able to generalize and maintain clinically applicable performance when deployed in new unseen environment using a few label um, example. And, um, and to basically for this setting, uh, the first questions that come to mind is that uh, to enable uh, rigorous development here, we need a good evaluation framework. Uh, and for this notion of data efficient generalization, uh, we basically took a three-way approach. So in addition to the standard in distribution performance of the model that usually you're gonna evaluate when, when designing AI models, we are also interested in auto distribution performance and adaptation capabilities. And um, for this purpose, we are basically measuring performance in zero shot and few shot fashion. Zero shot performance is the performance of uh, each model out of the box in new clinical setting. And uh, what we expect that um, here is to have some performance drop, but not a catastrophic uh, drop, up, drop up performance. And in any new setup uh, for few shots um, uh, setting, you may have access to some example to adapt your model to uh, to um, adapt your model to the new clinical workflow that you are facing. So, what we me measure here is that how many data points do you need to reach the clinically applicable performance in this uh, new setting. So. Um, to, to do this evaluation uh, better, we consider multiple imaging modality and task, and uh, this uh, medical task uh, is spanning from dermatology, retinal imaging, chest X-ray interpretation, and pathology and mammography. So in each of these settings, as you can see, we have different ratio of unlabeled data in distribution data and out of distribution data set uh, that uh, that they've been like, collected from uh, different uh, clinical setting. What we encounter in each of these uh, imaging tasks is a complex combination of distribution shifts. So this include new technology uh, shift, population shift, uh, which can basically arise from going to a new state or country, or behavior shift, which is usually due to workflow change. And um, to give you an overview of uh, the method and how Remedies basically is working, uh, Remedies uh, leveraging a combination of large scale pre-training on natural images, followed by another step of intermediate self-supervised learning on unlabeled medical data. We use this combination to build up a strong foundational model, basically, because we want to basically getting exposed to broad data, both clinic, clinical data and um, natural images. And, um, and building this foundation model, uh, we can get, adapt, uh, get that model adapted later using minimal label data uh, requirement in the new setting. Um, and this is like usually working because using billions of images available on internet, you can learn very strong visual representation and uh, adapt these general uh, foundation models to the medical dom domain using um, available unlabeled medical data using self-supervision. And um, this is very simple, but very effective uh, combination and uh, can reduce the need to uh, basically any task specific label medical 
data significantly. Uh, to give you like more detail of what's happening inside remedies, one of the aspects of the remedies is self-supervision, which is a very important uh, component. And we primarily use a simpler method as our backbone, which is maximizing the agreement between different augmented crop uh, via uh, contrastive learning. And uh, But this recipe is basically very much compatible with other self-supervised methods, uh, which I will show you the result on that uh, later. In terms of um, the result and the performance of uh, remedies, uh, we first established a, a strong supervised baseline, which is a model trained on 300 million natural images without any intermediate self-supervision on medical domain. This strong supervised baseline has been shown to be the best in class for transfer learning over the past few years. When we compare uh, or method to this um, supervised baseline, we observe across all of these six, six tasks that I uh, mentioned and modalities that we are targeting, there is a, a strong improvement for in distribution performance indicated by this um, uh, bar graph in the left side of each panel. Blue is remedies and orange one is the baseline, a strong baseline as I explained. And in addition to uh, uh, in distribution performance, we observed that there are a significant improvement in zero shot and few shot auto distribution performance. Blue line, which is remedies is consistently uh, above the orange line, which is the baseline. And even when you are increasing the number of samples uh, used for adaptation and retraining, uh, Remedies has a better uh, performance and keep that performance up during the training. And also we can say that, uh, see that like um, uh, with further analysis that uh, Remedies is pretty much like generic and compatible with any contrastive supervised uh, learning strategy. We show that um, multiple type of remedies with different self-supervision strategy at heart, including MOCO, Barrow, Twin, Simclear, or Relic. And in all of these cases, uh, we show that um, they, they, they basically have the same behavior and they are significantly improved over the baseline. So uh, to summarize that, um, um, what we see from remedies as a foundation model is that um, as a foundation model, remedies ex ex exhibit high generalization capabilities, improving or in distribution performance up to 11%, out of distribution performance up to 10% over a strong supervised baseline that we had. Remedies also lead to a strong data efficient generalization of medical imaging AI. You can reach basically clinically applicable performance by using only three to 100 times uh, less data in a new setting, uh, which is a, a huge deal. Uh, what I mean by clinically applicable is something that allows us to confidently deploy the model in real world. This could be a performance matching human radiologist or a clinician and such. Uh, this means in this technique that we have at hand allow fast deployment and acceleration, uh, and we see the acceleration of like life cycle of uh, medical AI uh, de deployment. And uh, there is a significant reduction in annotation and deployment costs uh, using such method. And also uh, code and uh, checkpoints of uh, remedies is available at or uh, GitHub repo and PhysioNet as I marked here. So um, the second part of the talk, I'm, I'm majorly gonna um, cover uh, METPOM, uh, which is uh, our effort toward interactivity uh, in, uh, in medical domain. So our work uh, has been basically taught us that um, AI uh, on its own cannot solve all of healthcare problem and medicine after all is about caring about people. Uh, what makes us healthy is complicated, specific to geography and 
most of the time even influenced by social drivers and we believe that is like very important to actively uh, work uh, to include diverse experiences and perspective and expertise when we are building a system and data and algorithm must be combined with language and interaction and empathy and compassion so um, um, we took our first step towards all of these uh, goals uh, by introducing MedFund uh, that has been uh, published in Nature uh, two months ago. So with the goal of making AI model in medicine to be more effective and more helpful and also safer using language and interactivity, um, we started to work in the space of uh, basically uh, language for medical purpose. And the first step was to basically moving toward rethinking conversational AI system uh, by introduction of MedPalm, uh, which is a Google's flagship large language model designed to provide high quality and alternative answer to medical questions. To give you an example of like how MedPalm is working is and can basically help customers or physician, you can imagine a medical assistant that can be used to answer medical questions or concern um such as like um what is the best cure for typhoid or can stress cause a nosebleed or can hair loss grow back and many more questions uh similar to this and why this is important you can imagine that um Answering medical questions uh, basically implies that you can have models that encode medical knowledge. And LLM for science and biomedicine indeed been a very active area for the past two, three years. Uh, the, this uh, basically uh, graph showing the timeline that we have with the introduction of the basically BioBert uh, back in 2019. And we have multiple efforts uh, to basically introduce uh, um, NLP capabilities for scientific texts and biomedical and clinical tasks. And for clinical tasks, the use of uh, US medical licensing exam multiple choice question as benchmark been a usual practice where the pass mark for a new doctor in this exam is often around 60%. This question has been considered a grand challenge for AI system because answering this medical question means that um, you need to recall medical knowledge and apply logic to identify the correct answer that we have at hand. And despite years of effort from leading AI labs around the world, performance of the um, most of the model um, in this challenging task been um, plateaued around 50%. And last December, by introduction of MedFarm, designed uh, by your team, um, we basically see the first AI system to exceed the passing mark on this exam and reaching the performance of 67%. This was the beginning of the journey, basically. And pushing this boundary in March 2000, uh, 2023, we introduced MedPalm 2, the next evolution of MedPalm, and MedPalm 2 is the first AI system to perform at the physician level in answering medical uh, licensing exam question and reaching the performance of 86%. So um, both MedPalm and MedPalm 2 um, basically has been trained on top of Google's foundation model, relying on few shot capabilities of such models. And um, moving from MedPalm to MedPalm 2, we bridged the gap that you see in performance uh, by uh, basically uh, performing like multiple type of method and combination of um, improving the LLM that we've been like using uh, from uh, uh, Palm 2 versus Plum Palm. And uh, we've been like basically doing extensive medical domain fine tuning using different techniques that some of them, they are uh, parameter efficient techniques. Some of them, they are relying on more uh, resources. 
and to train my thumb, um, uh, we work with a panel of clinicians across the US, the UK, and India. And we basically took a set of representative uh, answer for question that we have uh, from this panel of clinicians. And then aligning and tuning our model to produce answer that they are uh, look like, uh, more look like clinician answer. So we asked doctor to provide answer and we're pushing the models to produce similar answer and basically mimicking the behavior and the style of writing the answer. So um, here you can see that uh, some of this uh, uh, um, basically uh, representative answer that we've been collecting from doctors. And so there is a question, there is a answer that is coming with that question that sometimes could be very long, sometimes it's sh shorter, but most of the time they are like very comprehensive uh, answer to, to the question that we have. In addition to the tuning technique, uh, we also leverage a new uh, basically prompting a strategy called ensemble refinement. And in a nutshell, uh, in this method, we leverage LLMs to improve itself by producing multiple reasoning paths uh, for a majority voting procedure. So we have like two stage. Um, basically, uh, you're giving a few shot chain of thought prompt to, to the model and a question. And the model produce multiple possible uh, generate, gener, generate answer generated uh, uh, using temperature samplings. And for example, each generation can be involved explanation and answer for a multiple choice question that, that, that I explained. Then the model is conditioned on original prompt question and the concatenated generation from the previous step and is prompt to produce a refined explanation of the answer. Uh, this is basically a form of uh, generalization of like self-consistency consistency method and um, and you can imagine a plurality vote uh, procedure here. So we use LLM to improve itself. Beyond um, the multiple choice question that I explained, um, which been you know, like a huge uh, benchmark uh, over the past uh, few years, um, what we are basically really interested um, uh, in terms of LLM for medicine, is that to have long form answers and to be capable of providing long form answers to question in a safe manner. And, and uh, for this purpose, uh, we use a panel of clinician and their judgment to evaluate our methods and their uh, answers that, that has been provided by the large language model that we have. And um, we're asking this panel clinician to identify whether the model is performing better across a set of human values that includes low likelihood of medical harm, alignment with scientific consensus, precision, and lack of bias. We also introduce uh, adversarial question to probe or model uh, uh, around limitation uh, that they may have very carefully. So what we are seeing here is a pairwise ranking uh, a study uh, over 1066 consumer medical questions and MedPalm 2 and uh, MedPalm 2's answer were preferred over physician answer uh, by a panel of physicians across eight out of nine axes of evaluation that we had. Also one of the other uh, evaluation that we are doing for LLMs uh, in this space is a non-expert evaluation. Basically, how a non-expert lay user feel about the answer produced by an LLM. So here, um, a non-expert lay user consider MedPalm to answer more directly helpful and relevant than MedPalm uh, answer, the previous version, and the physician answer. And um, I'm going to show you also an example of 
uh, how MedPalm um, is working versus like MedPalm 2. Uh, in this example, you can see that considering such human value in alignment and training of our model between these two iteration, MedPalm 2 answer um, has become more comprehensive, precise, and safer, and similar to the physician answer. And um, and MedPalm to answer basically rated as more be more complete, factual, factually accurate, and less prone to be to have like missing information. But we see missing information in MedPalm one answer. So uh, before closing a little topic here, I want to just like mention that um, and remind that human evaluation benchmarking and uh, is an ongoing effort. Um, we we need to work towards designing benchmarks that they are more effective. We saw that USMLE as one of the challenge that has been around for many years, right when we saturated. There is a huge room for improvement of definition of each measure that we are considering here and each of the access and also having a retrospective study in the space to basically probe limitation of this model better. And on the last part of the talk, I'm going to speak about multimodal capabilities uh, and how we are basically um, moving towards uh, more generalist capabilities here. Despite significant progress that we had in biomedical AI, um, we know that most of the AI models that we have in this space is they are basically unimodal single task systems. And but the reality is that medicine is inherently multimodal, and data that we are dealing with them uh, spanning rich modalities, including text, imaging, medical records, genomics, and more. And clinicians also often use and interpret um, and make diagnosis based on wide range of data provided uh, to them. So if you envision a world in which uh, this AI system eventually to be used by patients and doctors, we should actually head towards uh, a fully generalist and interactive AI system. You can imagine an AI collaborator that can help to interpret and make decisions based on um, any kind of data that we are entering to the system. And at the end of the day, also communicate the result through text or audio. So MedPalm M or MedPalm Multimodal was the first demonstration of such generalist model with, uh, with uh, these capabilities. And MedPalm M is a large multimodal generative model that we introduced a month ago uh, that's capable of uh, flexibly encode and inter interpret biomedical data, including clinical language and various imaging and genomic uh, data with the same set of uh, model weight. So we have a single model that is capable of handling everything at, at the same time. This single biomedical AI system that you see um, is multitask and multimodal and basically is capable of uh, performing 14 different uh, tasks including medical image classification, medical question answering, visual question answering, radiology report generation, and summarization, and also is capable of handling genomic variant calling, as, as I'm showing in this graph. What is at the heart of MedPalm M uh, is that in reality, we use three, uh, three uh, Google's foundation models at the heart. So we have a pathway language model, palm model uh, that I talked about it earlier. Uh, we have vision transformers, which are a foundation model for uh, vision. And uh, we use basically their extension of transformers for visual data, such as image and video. And uh, we built basically uh, MedPalm M on top of a palmy model. 
which is a multimodal language model that can process sequence of multimodal input, uh, including text, vision, and sen sensor data. And um, PAMI basically and interestingly has been designed to uh, control robots, but we are basically adapting this large model to the medical domain using uh, uh, data that we have at hand for each task. And for most of this uh, foundation model, we are not only inheriting the model archi architecture, um, as they are like pre-trained model, but MedPalm M heavily rely on general domain knowledge that has been like encoded in their model, in, in these models uh, parameter, and um, and basically uh, we are activating a lot of capabilities using few shot uh, um, methods. So. To enable progress towards this uh, overarching goal of like having um, a generous model and fine tuning and alignment of the uh, foundation models that we are like looking at, we introduced MultiMed Bench, uh, which is a benchmark spanning 14 di diverse biomedical tasks, uh, including uh, question answering, visual question answering, and so on and so forth. And um, the benchmark that we have at hand uh, is basically include uh, basically includes um, one million data samples from a diverse range of medical imaging, uh, basically modalities, pathology to different type of uh, uh, X-ray, CT, so on, and also multiple other uh, uh, textual uh, um, data. Uh, such as radiology report, medical question answers, and visual question answer, which are basically paired of the um, a medical image with with an uh, with a question and answer. And um, this proof of concept of uh, generalist uh, model, um, in terms of performance, you can see that I'm at Palm M, which is basically denoted by this shaded blue area is competitive with or exceed prior a state of the art result uh, uh, from a specialist model, uh, which we are like denoting them by red line here on all of the tasks that we had in our benchmark. And um, interestingly, MedPalm M achieved this using a single set of model weight uh, without any task specific customization. So, um, in addition, uh, also we are looking at human evaluation of MedPalm uh, M generated radiology reports, and we can see that um, a radiology report generated by MedPalm M prepared over human generated uh, reports uh, over 40% of the cases that we had. And um, basically, this is suggesting potential clinical uh, utility. Uh, but we need definitely we need more improvement here. And uh, one interesting thing is that we're also observing some emerging capabilities, including zero shot generalization to new task that uh, concept that we never basically trained a model on them. That I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. So um we can see that um basically large met palm M um exhibit zero shot chain of thought reasoning capabilities in identifying and describing TB related finding in chest X-ray image. This is a thing that we never basically trained a model, but the way that we are approaching this is we are instruction tuned. Uh, we are giving the instruction to the, to the model to basically start to explain that, like what are the TB related uh, um, finding that you can see in the chest, chest X-ray image that we have. And uh, the model is prompt with a task specific instruction and in a text only exemplar to generate a report describing finding in the given uh, X-ray image, as you can see. And we have uh, three different sizes of the MedPalm M model and a larger one uh, basically starting to produce a result that they are uh, acceptable and like more concrete. 
model prediction from metpalm m is shown together with the annotation from an expert radiologist for human evaluation and the uh, boxes that you can see here like uh, colored with blue and red and um, grayish area is basically coming from that human evaluation and it's interesting that this model without any further training um, can correctly localize the major TB related lesion that has been in the right upper loop. However, it is failing to address the smaller lesion that we had like in the left uh, upper lobe of, uh, of the uh, X-ray that you see here. So, um, but in terms of emerging capabilities means that like when you go to a larger scale, you can see better capabilities. Uh, we see that a smaller metpalm m basically failed completely to generate any coherent report. And this is indicating that the importance of scaling and a larger size, model size for zero, zero shot uh, chain, of thought, uh, ch chain of thought reasoning that we see here. So um, I would like to take a few moments to basically talk about the North Star vision that we have here, um, which is uh, way beyond the proof of concept that I showed you um, that, uh, that we try to basically create. So you can imagine um, an extension of such system, um, such generalist model that can potentially enable impactful application that they are basically ranging from care delivery to scientific discovery. And um, we can have an AI doctor as a trusted aid um, to millions of clinicians and uh, in a pocket of billions of people. Um, and such such basically system they are no longer a dream for us and um, as we are getting more capable uh, in cross-modal processing of multiple form of data um, you can also imagine that um, an AI scientist helping or researcher to understand biology and enabling scientific discovery when you are combining multiple type of data and handling them, handling them at the same time. And um, also, um, there are multiple broader consideration here uh, uh, that I want to basically point out. And this consideration basically is spanning safety of this model. We, we see that uh, we have increasingly capable AI system that we need to navigate them. Um, we have problem at the trust section. Um, the question is gonna be that, how do we build trust among clinician and patient using this AI system that they are very much capable? We have multiple question and concern regarding uh, equity. How do we ensure that we don't amplify existing disparities that they are in healthcare system using the models that they are more capable? And there are multiple also open question uh, regarding regulation. How do we want to verify and validate uh, such system? And it's still a product and incentives here are a big question. How does the product and user, user experience basically look like for this capable AI system and who pay for, for them? And at the end, I just like want to acknowledge that this is a work of um, a lot of researcher uh, across Google uh, that basically enabling uh, uh, this past development uh, that we had over the past year. And thank you all. If you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, it's great. A lot of uh, information. Um, so I can see that you start from the vision model, then go to the language model, metapalm, and then uh, at the end, talk about a multi-model, uh, large foundation model. So I agree that multi-model uh, is also the trend, uh, is the way to go. So Professor Wang and I and the two other co-authors recently, we um, wrote a correspondence paper, multi-model radiology AI. So we see the same thing that uh, 
multi-model is a way to do that. Uh, I do have one uh, specific uh, technical question regarding the multi-model, um, large foundation model. So you mentioned the uh, language part, you have a large language model, a vision part, you can use the VIT, but how about other modalities? For example, the genomics, um, how do you actually um, take that kind of uh, modality as the example uh, into your uh, multi-model? So uh, for this specific demonstration, the way that we are handling genomic data is actually, um, um, is that uh, we have the variant, uh, which is basically translation of sequence, like genome uh, sequence to image. And we are feeding them as e uh, image and we are just like focusing on the variant calling. But uh, there is a like actually very interesting question. And um, I think for designing such model, um, and it's, it's basically the question of interplay of like having one large model versus having multiple specialist model that we are, we are basically enabling them through model grafting. And like, it's possible that, that the next generation of such technology basically relying on to have uh, a specialist models that they are like a smaller for each specific task. For example, one of the challenges that we were like facing even like beyond uh, uh, decoding sequence data, sequence like coming from genome uh, was basically um, handling uh, large um, high resolution images. You can uh, imagine that like, for example, for mammography model, we have uh, localized uh, like uh, general uh, views that we need to make decision. And like basically tokenizing that those like large image is a huge challenge right now. So we need to have like a new model architecture in this space. And we need to also study and research that uh, what is the interplay of having a single large model versus having uh, multiple smaller model for different tasks. Oh, sounds great. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Um, Professor Wang, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Aziji. I have uh, first the question. You mentioned that you use adversary questions. How do you design adversary questions? So for adversarial question, like basically, which is falling into red theming of uh, this large language model, this is like a very active area of research or multiple like way of like that you can like approach that. But like, for example, to give you a solid uh, like example and like easy to digest example here, you can see that like we can have like multiple uh, like concept that we are like interested in them. It could be like, for example, if we want to target gender bias or we want to target equity or we want to target uh, like topics that usually we don't want or like LLM to talk about them. You can see those type of thing even when you're like interacting with ChatGPT, asking some question, uh, the model is going to answer back that, okay, I'm a LLM, I cannot answer these or that questions. So. First, basically, we need to find out what topic we want to target. For example, for the gender, you can see that uh, if we, we want to have a model that if we are switching the gender, uh, it would understand and produce the answer that is like uh, correct for that gender. So the way that we are going to do is that if we have a specific to gender question, we are going to create manually another set of question that uh, the gender is swap and it has like another maybe uh, answer to, to the question and see that like how the language model is going to um, uh, produce answer and if it's still the answer is going to be correct. And uh, there is a various methods that basically uh, um, uh, we are using and we have a large team that basically working in that space to uh, basically increase the safety of the method that we have in the medical space. Uh, okay, I see several questions here. My last question, and you mentioned, I'm very interested in the technology, you call it uh, ensemble refinement. 
And it's a very interesting, I guess, very effective. Uh, have you ever considered you use multiple large models, similar models to do ensemble refinement at a larger scale? Um, so basically we never like try that. It, it's gonna be like, uh, it's this is falling basically to an ensembling method basically. Uh, but the way that they are doing it, because of the large scale of this model, you can imagine that the computation cost is very high if we want to basically curate multiple models at the same time. And usually the way that um, this like ensemble method is happening in real world for medical purpose, LLM, or like beyond that, is that they are basically using the same model and there are temperature parameters that you can play with that to create more reasoning paths to increase like basically um, creativity of the methods to produce answer which uh, is interplayed with hallucination um, and it's going to be like more cost effective if you do it this way rather than having multiple parallel large model mm -hmm. at the same time um but yeah uh i haven't i i don't recall any like a study that basically showing that uh how it's gonna work that for example if you do um like ensemble refinement using chat gpt gpt4 and gpt 3.5 um versus like having multiple replica of like i don't know chat gpt so uh i don't i don't remember anything but like uh to the best of my knowledge this is the best way to do that I uh, have more questions, but uh, Ping Kun, I see several questions in chat window, so I will stop here. Okay, all right, thank you. So we can uh, give the audience uh, uh, the chance to ask questions. Um, I see actually the very last question, very interesting. Um, so does MAT uh, Palm model model perform different model based tasks independently or make medical decisions with multi model data jointly? So I, I think that's related to uh, the previous question on multi-model. So the model is capable of handling um, many different can, uh, modalities, but does each time it take one uh, modality to make a decision or it takes multiple modalities kind of uh, can candidate them to uh, make a decision? Uh, so, um... So the, the way that we are like doing it right now for uh, when we want to like uh, evaluate the performance, we are just like giving one modality and like asking, uh, like prompting the basically model to produce that specific task. But uh, you can imagine that um, we also pair like, for example, text with image, which is uh, like a basically taking multiple modality inside and then, then answering. But like definitely there is gonna be like next version uh, you can you can imagine the next version that is um, uh, basically having like maybe multiple modalities. One of the blocker for such re research is actually data. Data is mm -hmm. becoming more and more challenging. And like uh, up until now, um, what I would say that like we had a lot, lot of like old fashioned data sets that they are basically one data set with the labels coming. And like it wasn't a lot of consideration of like basically pairing data set or like um, uh, combining them. But uh, the topic of data is getting more and more important to have, for example, data set um, um, that have um, like, I don't know, CT, MRI, and like, I don't know, text information for, for a given like uh, task. Uh, those data sets are very rare. So evaluation is just like uh, a slower and like adaptation of them. Okay, yeah, uh, I definitely actually understand that the medical data is already like not that uh, much, but if you want to pair data even uh, harder, absolutely. Yeah, yeah thanks. So uh, maybe uh, come to uh, just two more questions. Uh, earlier question that uh, do foundation models necessarily need the encoders? What kind of network architecture is that? Uh, so a foundation model i won't say that like we need um, only like encoder or like transformers like for example remedies that they presented is basically on top of resonance model large resonance model that they are like 152 um, times like two or three uh that we had they aren't like in the order of like billion but they are like um they are still like large um 
vision transformer models that they are generally like larger and uh, so they are basically transformer based model encoder decoder uh, and and so on uh, so I would say that like the most important characteristic of these like methods is that you're enabling self supervision and it means that you can basically digest a lot of um, unlabeled data and just like learn the representation that is like inside the data. Um, the architecture is not important. The objective that you're using to train this model is like more important here. That, for example, it could be contrastive learning, which is uh, like uh, a major like trend uh, of uh, like self supervision. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so one uh, quick clarification question: um, Why isn't a Mad Palm two used as the uh, large language model in the uh, Mad uh, Palm model model? Mad Palm app. Yeah. Um, um, so. Um, the reason was that uh, basically we wanted to have the first demonstration um, in a way with like minimal uh, like modification and like um, Palm E was based on Palm model, which is a, like an older version and Palm 2, which is like the newer model has been like basically recently released. Uh, so we couldn't have like a lot of like development on that uh, and it was like basically introduced after the start of the project. But definitely, like swapping that is gonna like Im improve the capabilities, language capabilities that we have inside the Metal Map. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. We are a few minutes uh, over now. Uh, other than a couple of more uh, clarification questions, but I think they can just uh, read the paper and find out the detail. Sorry for that. And uh, yeah, thank you again, uh, Shakufei, for your wonderful talk. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks so much for inviting me and uh, having me here. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending the talk. Thanks. See you next time. Bye.